making all this Zoom stuff working, so. So the setup. Um, I'll pass the mic around if anybody's got any uh, introductions, if you haven't been here before, or if it's been a long time since you've been here, or you've got a meeting announcement or a job opening or anything, anything else. Anybody at this table? No, no? Oh, okay. New members, we need more members. Hello, 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 anybody? What's happening in Arizona, George? Nothing that I'm aware of. <laughs> Anybody here? Uh, Jim, tell us about the SIMPTI thing that you just did with the Education Committee. Okay, well, we went down to uh, <clears throat> Cal State Long Beach, and um, SIMPTI's had an initiative to bring more <laughs> students and young people into the, uh, into the society. And... Um, we had a great uh, presentation by a, a gentleman, A.J. Blair, who's a videographer, director, but uh, he's one of these people that takes on anything. And, you know, his, his advice was never say no. Just say yes and figure it out later. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of shoots I've been on. Uh, but anyway, we had about 40 students, and we had maybe 30 signing up for SIMPTI, and we want to start a student chapter down there. So anybody wants to help and volunteer, uh, um, come see me. A couple other, if you know, if you've got uh, a son or daughter or nephews or grandchildren or anybody, all students uh, get their first year free uh, as a as a SIMPTI member. But for those in engineering, the big news is, as of the beginning of the year, if you're a SIMPTI member, you have free access to every standard. There's no longer, no longer need to, uh, to uh, pay, for, pay for individual standards. So that's a big incentive to uh, join or keep your membership on. I've got a limerick. David Williams, you might want to mute. Everybody wants to hear a limerick. <laughs> All right, now, I actually, uh, I, I used the chat GPT for this limerick. And, and, I, and, I, and I put in, you know, engineers and television and all that. So this is, this is not by me, but it's by AI. I, I, I got a bunch, but I'll do a couple here. There once were broadcast engineers so deft, making sure every signal was kept. From studio to air, they ensured the broadcast was fair, connecting the world with every concept. All right. All right. Well, that hey, this didn't is, work. This isn't me. This is a. All right. All right. I'll do another one here. There once were TV engineers so bright, bringing shows to our screens day and night. They tinkered with transmitters, fixed glitches with twitters, to ensure our entertainment took flight. All right. Don't blame the messenger. I'm just trying to entertain you guys. All right. All right. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, there is some openings at a teleport in Las Vegas. If anybody was uh, interested in needs uh, engineers um, and want to do some teleport, there, you know, if anybody wa wants to relocate, there's positions there. All right. Oh. Cool. Uh, Tell us about your Sunday, uh, what, the Super, Super Bowl? That little, that little game that was going on? Yeah. There was a game, yeah, it's a big game. Yeah, what, uh, I don't know, what do you want me to tell? It's a, you got over what? You made a lot of overtime. Today. It worked, yeah, I haven't had a day off in like 26 days. So, so was there audio? I don't know. <laughs> I'm in charge of transmission, not, uh, not the other stuff. Uh, I don't know what to say about it. It's, it, it, it all worked. It all worked. That's so it, 4K and uh, HDR and whatever else. Oh, and also, oh, well, go ahead. And it was the most watched yes. television show in Ooh. history. Ooh. And two and two days after, Para, Paramount announced a bunch of layoffs. 800 people. Yeah, 
They laid off 100 people, 800 people, right afterwards. So, uh, by the way, no. By the way, it's, I'm Tom Patterson from CBS Television. Uh, we will have two positions open in my department in broadcast maintenance. It hasn't been posted yet, but uh, if you're interested, look at Paramount Global, whatever it's called, careers or whatever it is. So it should be posted within the next few weeks if uh, anybody is interested. There you go. Uh, it was, it was, I think, it was the, the single broadcast entity and its associated hangers honors there with Paramount and Nickelodeon and all that. But more people watched like the moon landing and, and some of the things, which was across the whole, every network, you know, at the time or other, other things like that or coverage after 9-11 perhaps or something like that, so. Hi. Chris Spacone with the Advanced Systems Group. Um, John Scheich is up there. Paul, one of the guys I think I work with at uh, Revolt. Um, really happy to be here. Uh, I have to say uh, props out to my son, Mitchell. He's at uh, Apple Music. He basically put together the entire studio for the Apple Music people. Usher showed up. He was like, oh, hell yes. I could totally get into this production shit. Uh, so he is he is totally wrapped up in that whole thing. And as they say, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they say that too. That's right. Um, I'm uh, with USC. I'm their chief engineer at the Annenberg School of Communications and Journalism. We've got three studios out there. Anybody that's interested in coming on by, we would love to have you come out and take a look at that facility. I know Mike's <coughs> been out there uh, earlier this year. He's probably got great things to say about what we're doing out there. Um, we have some uh, router and switcher multi-viewer things that are changing. We're working on cameras, working on some robotics, we're working on remotes. There's a lot of really cool things. The gentleman over there, I can't remember his name, Jim? Jim? Uh, Jim? Uh, John Scheich has roped me into trying to get an, a SIMPI chapter started over at USC. <laughs> Count on calling. Uh, we're going to end up talking about that whole thing. Uh, I've already started the uh, process on, on, uh, on the campus with getting those guys on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally looking forward to that. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Is, is that... The facility you're talking about, that's separate from the cinema department? Yes, it's completely separate from the cinema department. It's the Annenberg School of Communications and Journalism. Um, one of the things that we do there, although we have three studios and we're really proud of the equipment that we have there, the equipment is really there to support teaching students how to tell stories. I think that's what's really, really important about what we do. Um, what we do is really not driving the bus. What we do is providing those students with the ability to tell the stories that are important to the rest of us. So that's what I end up doing, you know, as the EIC, trying to make sure that they get their, we have a daily live news that goes out. We have a weekly sports show that goes out on Wednesday. We have a magazine show that goes out on Thursday. Look us up on uh, YouTube. Um, it's very student, but, you know, we're proud of it anyway. Thank you very much. I never. Uh oh, Jeff. I'm changing character. So a lot of you know me as Jeff Longbottom, the consultant, engineer, technical program manager. A lot don't realize that I am actually a salesperson. So you're going to throw me out of this organization. That said, it works for me. my daughter is a high school senior and she's gonna be going to college next year, which means I need to sell a lot of stuff this year so I can afford, she doesn't know where she's going yet. SC is a possibility, UCLA is a possibility. Actually, SC isn't, she did apply to UCLA. So I'm just out here groveling and saying, if you have a big project, bring it to Diversify and I'm your guy. Second thing is, is a great resource that worked for me at DirecTV uh, got laid off recently. Unfortunately, 
there's a lot of layoffs of people over 50 at DirecTV. Um, this individual is a cybersecurity specialist that also knows broadcast in and out and is multilingual. So if any of you have a nece necessity for that, let me know. Perfect. I'll hook her up. Thank you, everybody. Sorry for groveling. Anybody else here? Anyway, thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, saddle up. Uh, our, our secretary, STE secretary, Bobby, is uh, our presenter tonight, and we're going to hear about uh, the history and the early days of satellite and how it's progressed and where we are today. So uh, if your microphone's on. Uh, check, check, check. I believe it There is. we go. So right. take it away. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out to Society of Television Engineers. It's a really great group. Uh, tell your friends and neighbors uh, and all your coworkers to come join. It is a find location, find employment, find friends, and uh, the whole group is fantastic. And I appreciate having uh, serving, you know, as, as you know, on the board of directors and the leadership with Bill and stuff like that. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk about broadcast satellite and, and many of you in this room, the engineers are, are very familiar with broadcast satellite and, uh, and the aspect of television and the where it's come and where it's actually is right now and going to. So um, I'm currently with uh, LBI satellite is Lyman Brothers Incorporated. Now, these are two brothers that started a teleport there in Utah, and they became one of the largest disaster recovery for fire and, and uh, emergency services um, in, in the nation. And what they do is um, typically they'll provide phone lines, IP. They also have a teleport backing up um, some of the, of the uh, church as well as some of the um, TV stations. So they have... Um, several dishes there and um, you know manage capacity on you know day-to-day -day basis 24 7 you know center there so what we're going to do today is I'm going to talk about um, the orbital slots um, there's a lot happening in the different orbital slots today uh, in right now so we're going to talk about the different orbital slots um, then we're going to go into um, some of the launch and lifespan of a broadcast satellite, the geostationary specifically. Um, you know, what happens to them from launch and uh, how they get there and where they go once uh, their lifespan is up. Uh, then we're going to talk about the frequencies, C-band, 5G, um, some of the things that are impacting broadcast today for all the distribution of, of uh, your TV. Um, we're going to get into SCPC, MCPC, uh, what DirecTV does and DISH uh, on their satellites to get so many uh, takers on, on you know, how, they, how they work to get coverage of all the U.S. and millions and millions of viewers. Um, then makeup of a signal. So this is going to be more about um, the contribution and how... Today we can get more, get more, we're getting some, okay, get more uh, bits and more bandwidth because of people like ESPN and, and some of these live TV shows, they're actually using satellite as a Remy platform where they'll bring all, all the cameras back on satellite, have a feedback to the studio. So they need to get more channels in that feed and in that megahertz. And along those lines, what the uplinks are doing to accommodate and build uh, those, basically the, the, the structure of, of the signals. Um, and then we'll do a quick recap of, you know, satellite at 60 plus. Um, actually, uh, the broadcast, the geostationary was, you know, proposed by Arthur C. Clarke in 1945. Uh, he stipulated that, you know, hey, you can stick one of these up and see a third of the Earth. 
Uh, so you can see the entire Earth with three satellites. And then in 62, Telstar 1 came up. Uh, so we'll talk about that. I have a little uh, show and tell on that video as well. Again, live TV. And then, um, you know, we'll wrap it up with, uh, you know, the broadcast IP, you know, what uh, Starlink is doing and uh, how that affects, you know, the uh, TV industry. So if there's any questions, feel free to ask, um, and I'll try to be brief and, you know, get, get us, uh, get our dessert and get done. So first things um, is the different orbital slots. As, as I mentioned, there's a lot going on in the different orbital slots, and that's been facilitated mostly by launch services. So the first orbital slot that was uh, for broadcast satellite uh, was the GEO. Uh, and that's when HBO came on in the 70s, and then CNN and all of these cable channels, as well as the network channels, discovered that, hey, we can put one signal up, and then all of our cable head ends can take them down. You know, without additional cabling, without additional charges, we can put them all, uh, get all of our affiliates to take our signal. So the, the, the challenge with that is that it's at 35,000 kilometers out there, so it takes them about half a second for a signal, a little less than half a second for a signal to actually get light speed up as well as back down to, the, to uh, your downlinks. There's also MEO. MEO is Middle Earth orbits. Now that's actually one of the first orbits that uh, was in space was the Telstar 1 was actually a MEO satellite. It's also used by your GPS as well as um, you know your International Space Station is in a in that orbit as well, and that's 8,000 to, 8, to um, 12,000 kilometers up. And then we also have the LEOs, and as I mentioned, there's a lot happening in LEO satellites, both from uh, Amazon, Cooper, as well as Starlink, and kind of a battle for, you know, all the pieces that are going up uh, into space and, and how that congests for the astronomers, how they are viewing stuff. So um, parts and pieces, lifetime, lifespan of a broadcast satellite, okay? So where that starts is on the launch pad. Uh, we'll actually design. Boeing usually designs, or, or Maxar will design these broadcast satellites. And then your carriers, Intelsat, SES, Utilsat, will purchase them and put them up into space. But with uh, the advent of, re of launch services, um, there's actually been more and more satellites going up. And I'm going to show you a little uh, launch here of a uh, Falcon 9 uh, going up. I don't know if we, does it get bit, uh, audio from my computer? Yep. <laughs> my computer. Yeah, that's where we're hearing it from. Well, um, this is an actual launch of a Falcon 9. Um, SpaceX has increased the number of launches uh, tremendously. So there's been more and more satellites this, uh, getting up into space than there ever has been in, in the history of uh, you know, satellites. Um, so along with that, uh, once they're up, they um, do a station raising from suborbital to their geostationary spot, uh, location. And usually they last about 15 years. After 15 years, uh, they'll, after 15 years, they'll, um, they'll need to be decommissioned. Now, or if they fail before uh, they, they, their lifespan, then the satellite failure, everyone may remember back in the 90s when Galaxy 4 kind of went down and all of their pagers went out. But <laughs> that, that was a satellite that failed. Um, what they'll do is control uh, the satellite and boost it out to a, a, about 200 uh, kilometers beyond the geostationary, and then it'll drift there. And There's a lot of satellites out there hanging out. So um, they'll also do um, 
so they'll also do an uh, atmospheric decommissioning is what I call it, is where they'll take the, whatever remaining fuel is still in the satellite and, and uh, boost it towards the Earth and, and have a controlled burn through the Earth's atmosphere and you know, kind of disintegrates the whole satellite. And that's kind of where the satellites go. Um, so now, uh, with those launch costs and how many uh, launches that they're doing now, the, the, the um, use of satellites has, ha there's been more and more satellites being launched. So I've got here also a, a nice little video of how SpaceX is actually la landing some of these, uh, uh, landing some of these rockets. So if you'll see, they have the fins there that will guide it down, and then they have a controlled uh, burn and land it on a smaller than a football-sized ship at, in the ocean. It's really amazing. Bam, right on target. So with the launches increasing, there's more opportunity in space than ever before. Um, with the orbital slots, as well as putting up uh, new technology and, and new, new footprints going up for satellites. There we go. Okay, so for um, on a satellite, the broadcast hardware on the geostationary is A, you have the solar panels. Okay, those are usually the largest features you'll see. They're, you know, usually 40 meters sticking out from each side. And with the gallium solar panels, they collect enough electricity to, to, to power a small town each, each day. And then they store it all into a battery uh, when the Earth eclipses it. Now, one of the things that I think is very uh, interesting is how they actually keep these satellites up because they are, you might be in the Earth orbit, uh, seeing it as a single spot, but they're actually moving in a, a figure eight, and it's called station keeping. And they use these Z, uh, ZIPS rockets. So this is an electric rocket that actually, it's not uh, combustion like you saw in the launch, but it is actually using magnets and electrons to push out uh, xenon gas um, out the back of the rocket engine. And the, the thrust on those is very minimal. It's almost like a sheet of paper. Um, and, but over time, that sheet of paper adds up and adds up, and then you got a ream of paper. And that's how they move these satellites around. Um, and then on the, um, then you have, of course, the, the transmitters the, and receive dishes on there. So, on the satellite, um, you, they're called bent pipe satellites or relay satellites, uh, the geostationary, because they're going to take the, the uh, whatever your signal you put up is going to be turned around and put back down to you guys. So the, on a typical satellite, there's 24 uh, transponders uh, on C-band, and they also have a KU payload. Uh, these transponders can range from a 36 megahertz or up to 72 megahertz, depending on the design of the satellite. Um, now, the frequencies uh, on the C-band uh, run anywhere from uh, 3 gigahertz to 8 gigahertz, and then on the KU band, it's 10 to 14. Now, this is what is one of the strengths of a broadcast satellite is the signal coverage. So if you've got a coverage, it covers the, the, a third of the Earth. So what these satellites will do will focus much of their power onto a specific uh, footprint. So this is a KU footprint over the US. And anyone who has the appropriate size dish can uplink or receive off of that. It's not like a, a cellular net map where you know everything is officially you know yeah it's all covered but you know you're always will have different uh, spots where there's just no cellular coverage this you can uplink anywhere whether it, you're at red rock 
or in the Midwest. Now, one of the new uh, technologies that are coming out, you know, it, it, or has come out, is uh, what they're called spot beams. And these are high throughput satellites. This is what Viasat's using, as well as um, 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 several of the, the, the IP uh, satellites. Uh, Intelsat is an Intelsat 40 bird. And what they're using is smaller beams with a higher power. And they'll use this to put more bandwidth into for airplanes. So you'll have um, a better throughput on an airplane because you'll have more concentrated focus of people there. You'll need a higher throughput. So they'll use spot beams like this to, to cover those locations. So as I mentioned before, um, we want to talk about the satellite signal design and, and efficiency. So many of the signals today uh, for contribution uh, are highly efficient on the bandwidth that they're using. Um, and a lot of that comes from um, A, the DISH, uh, advances in technology in the, in the SSPA, uh, as well as um, advances in how our modulation works. So here's a spectrum analyzer of what an analog signal used to look like. This was used back when C-band dishes were big, um, and you know HBO and uh, CNN were really using these satellites. You would have one channel per transponder. Uh, and it's, it's a bell curve. And then on the right and left of that curve, you'll see the noise floor, which is basically the uh, radiation of the Earth that you'll that just naturally occurs. And then in 2000, they came up with uh, digital signals. And this is a much more structured uh, ones and zeros kind of a signal, where most of the data is actually transmitted through that plateau at the top there. So on the sides that slope down to the noise floor, those are actually called the shoulders of the signal. And sometimes if you don't have a good uh, signal, uh, I mean, good uh, line of sight up to your satellite, those shoulders can get big and interfere with adjacent carriers. But keeping them small is very, uh, is, means you're going to get a better um, throughput because you don't miss any bits on your downlink. So the signal, uh, some of the signal advances uh, that have happened in, the, in our industry is developing from the DVB standard, uh, which is digital video broadcast, and then S is for satellite. So the, we went from, you know, in the early 90s, DVB-S to S2, uh, which is going to have about a 30% modulation uh, throughput increase, and then S2X is what a lot of our uh, contribution uplinks are doing now where you know they're getting multiple channels uh, through a you know smaller bandwidth and typical now is anywhere from six megahertz to nine megahertz on the transponder um, per channel now in the design you also can manage uh, your throughput with um, your uh, qpsk and 8psk this is in the signal um, how many points of data that you can pull. Now, what's enabled us to get more uh, points of data is the hardware and the processing speed of our hardware, increasing and improving. So that is able to uh, decode and, and uh, manage all that data that's coming through the fire hose. And then, of course, you've got uh, in improvements on dish uh, capacity, um, more sensitive LNBs, which is the actual receiver at the end of your dish, um, where the dish takes the signal and reflects it and concentrates it on that LNB. So there's materials that they've been working with that have made that more sensitive, uh, as well as uh, you know when with 5G, um, actually they're using filters as well to kind of um, block some of that adjacent noise uh, that's coming from the 5G interference. So some of those technologies are all improving uh, the 
channel mm, density up on transponders and the capability of satellites to broadcast more channels. We were talking earlier today about DirecTV and how many channels they're, they're pushing into these geostationary satellites. They're, uh, they're getting very aggressive on, on the modulation as well as um, compression on those, on those channels to try to increase you know, number of channels. The more channels you have up, the more channels you can charge uh, to you know, revenue from those uh, networks. So that's um, some of the hardware that we're uh, seeing and being improved is at the teleport side um, on for, for broadcast of your direct TV uh, dish network and things like that. But on the contribution, it's, satellite is really still the one of the most um, uh, secure um, ways to transmit because satellite is uh, the the a completely um, di diverse infrastructure from your live venue. So you have your venue. A satellite truck will have power, its own power. It'll have an uplink. And then you have your satellite and your downlink. That's the entire network versus, you know, with uh, some of the IP and, and fiber and stuff like that, you have a lot of uh, locations that are repeating and redundant um, and the opportunity for, for failure. So this is a, this uh, second picture there is actually at the Super Bowl, you know, the picture of the trucks. And, th and this is, not all of the trucks. This is just the ones that were lined up there at the Legion. So contribution is still very strong for satellite. And if you have, um, uh, just the other day, uh, I had a, a buddy of mine whose boxing match, the venue internet was not working. They had to go into and bring in the satellite truck because it is a completely separate transmission path. So that is some of the, um, you know, the hardware and trucks for contribution. Now to IP. So here's a picture of uh, the antennas for uh, a plane. So uh, aero, ship, uh, all your cruises and things like that are all doing a phased array antenna. And that is to bring more IP into uh, per megahertz in, into uh, the airplane. And then, of course, um, what a lot of media is covering is the Starlink uh, and, and the uh, availability on the LEO satellites. Uh, because of all of the more launch services, they're able to put up literally thousands of satellites in the low Earth orbit. And remember I mentioned about the lifespan of, uh, of a satellite? So just this week, there's going to be about 100, 150 satellites that Starlink is going to deorbit into the atmosphere. They were just, they're like, okay, these are old, and they were specifically designed. So the material that they used in the satellite was specifically designed to deorbit like this in order to keep space junk down. So that's kind of where we're at with satellite. Um, from the broadcast side, um, putting more channels into uh, your direct TV and dish uh, with compression, modulation, um, as well as better uplink facilities, then as well as a higher throughput beams and more powerful satellites. Um, now, we'll, we're going to go back a little bit and do a little bit of history of satellite, you know, kind of where we've come from. And as I mentioned, um, Arthur C. Clarke uh, proposed the geostationary satellite. And then, then Telstar 1 was the first um, satellite for broadcast. And this was a transatlantic satellite uh, that covered initially was um, the uh, Statue of Liberty. And um, they had a Cubs game. Now, the satellite only lasted for about eight months. Uh, and it only had one channel. It was a MEO satellite that had uh, 
um, an epigee of 592 meter uh, kilometers, and then uh, a perigee of over uh, 3,000 kilometers. So it only had a usable window of about 30 minutes out of a 2.5 hour orbit. But it worked. And here is the first transmission across the Atlantic. It was between AT&T and the EBU, European Broadcasting Union. going to wait uh, for your signal. If that's been completed, we'll go on that signal. Hello, Walter Cronkite. Hello, United States. On my television screen here in Brussels, I have on the left-hand side the Statue of Liberty, on the right-hand side the Eiffel Tower. They are both together in clear. So go, America, go. Go, America, go. Good evening, Europe. This is the North American Continent so Live by an AT&T Telstar, July 23rd, 1962, 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time in the East, live the New York skyline on the Atlantic Ocean, and that's the Brooklyn Bridge. On the west, 3,000 miles away, San Francisco, 12 noon at the Golden Gate Bridge, high above the entrance of San Francisco Park. The same sun, which has just set over the Mediterranean and the English Channel, has reached its zenith here, but is above the clouds hanging over San Francisco. On the north, one of the longest unguarded borders on this planet. So they had this for uh, 30 minutes. They had a Cubs game play out, as well as a speech by uh, John F. Kennedy uh, talking about the monetary fund. So that was the first transatlantic Trans, uh, uh, transmission, and that was back in 1962. Then in the 70s, as I mentioned, HBO um, started utilizing geostationary satellites as well as CNN. And the common US hobbyist got wind of this. And then in the 80s is when the big C-band dishes blew up because they realized that they, if as long as they had a satellite dish, no matter where in the US you were, West Virginia, or New York, they could receive HBO, CNN, and all of these national networks. So that's where that industry grew from, is hobbyists. Uh, then, um, of course, HBO, and they didn't like that. So they started to uh, conditional access. And that's where conditional access is still even today for coverage of uh, the US, of Middle East, of, of um, Asia is utilized to spread to w with you know paramount and abc and nbc they still use uh the conditional access cards to manage all their content but it's still up there it's still you know if you've got the uh, correct equipment and know-how you could still bring those down so so that was this, the beginning of the end for the backyard C band dish was the conditional access. And then, of course, your direct TV and dish network. And there was a third carrier called Prime Star that came out in the 90s to do small KU dishes. And um, Prime Star didn't make it off the launch pad. But of course, as you know, direct TV and dish are still running strong today. And it's still the same technology into the, the, the 18, I mean, I mean the 38 inch small dishes for your home services, um, and, and they're still got millions and millions of subscribers. So, and then in the 2000s to, to, to 2020 with the digital signal, um, a lot of channels for contribution started using uplink trucks and uplink trailers and um, being uh, able to uplink from, you know, golf courses and um, places that, that, you know, really it was the most reliable. And back then without internet, that was how you got content out. It was king of the world. And now in 2020, 
one and um, to, to today uh, with the C-band and 5G spectrum um, being sold to uh, the cellular carriers, there is less capacity up, uh, available to uh, broadcasters. However, um, they are still utilizing the KU side as well as uh, C-band for contribution uh, and able to use um, you know, much of the, not much, use the C-band for distribution as well. It's just, it's a smaller pool than what used to be in the market. Um, so that's what satellite today is, uh, is um, on the broadcast side, uh, still using it for contribution, distribution, and then I, they also use it for IP. So Southern California Edison will use the geostationary satellites with iDirect uh, modems, and they'll bring all of the data for transformer stations, uh, for dams and remote locations, all back to their uh, headquarters uh, via geostationary uh, satellites, all via IP. So it, we were using broadcast satellite in a lot of, lot of different ways. The LEO and Starlink is, is a, a great solution. Um, and you know, I see LEO being a, a strong for your home, net, home internet. Um, however, for video and broadcast, uh, Starlink has some shortcomings and challenges. Um, it, it has, because you're a satellite that is traveling uh, over your antenna, then you switch to a different satellite. They haven't quite gotten that handoff right, and the, your video loves constant, constant uh, bandwidth. It, it, it doesn't like to be interrupted, you know, whereas, you know, trans, um, IP is made to be interrupted and, and move different packets to different locations. So the geostationary satellites um, are, are still the bread and butter and, and robust signal uh, for contribution still. Um, and then for distribution, you know, you, you, DirecTV, you put another dish out there. Uh, it doesn't cost them much, yet they still charge another 100 bucks a month. <laughs> so it's amazing that business model is, uh, you know, it just it makes money. But that's my presentation. I thank you. Um, and uh, if you have uh, some questions, let's, uh, let's have them. Any questions? All right. <laughs> Hi there. Hey, Joe. Thanks for the presentation. Um, space junk, and I heard you use the term uh, something like um, <clears throat> something like uh, decommission, or it wasn't that quite that term, but atmospheric de. Uh, yes. now, yeah, right. Retirement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know that well. Uh, yeah, so um, does that really mean like do they um, self-destroy or what happens to them? Is it still contributing to space junk or are they kind of, you know, So the low Earth orbits are, are, at the end of this week, they will be no more. They will be completely demolished. Uh, because of the atmosphere, just like an, an asteroid, it, they design these with materials yeah. that will light up and, and, and be completely destroyed. Now, there is a lot. And there's a big problem about older satellites there in both NEO and geo uh, orbits that they don't have fuel or control enough to bring them into the atmosphere to have them, you know, decommissioned. So, um, you know, there's a lot of talk of, about a, you know, going up and cleaning up and with a, you know, different things. But b, with the with the advent of more launches going up. They, Intelsat actually has a refueling um, service. So they're actually reinvigorating old satellites to, by, by putting up a new, uh, basically a fuel tank. And they'll, they'll actually um, bring satellites back to life and, and operational. I see. And then if they can't be rejuvenated, 
we have the Russian satellite you know, destruction. That's system. right. <laughs> Vlad will take care of it. Don't worry about it. Vlad will take care of it. <laughs> I'll go over here. It's easier to come over, bring a mic to you. So, Bobby, I hear you uh, talking about the comparisons between GEO, MEO, and LEO uh, services. Mm -hmm. And at, towards the end of your presentation, and thank you very much for that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very informative. It was pretty much right on. The LEO service that you're talking about, the Starlinks and, and, and the Kuipers and, and whatnot, uh, right, the, those folks, Obviously, they're going to leverage REST and SRT and things like that for forward error correction and being able to push enough bits into the pipe to mm -hmm. be able to reconstruct during changeover from one satellite to another. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask you a really difficult question. Uh, you guys seem to be in the geo space. You mm -hmm. seem to be more or less in the teleport space where you're pointed at a, a geo satellite. How do you see the MEO and the LEO business cannibalizing things happening in the geo. What is your sort of value proposition for geo versus the Mio Leo uh, trade? So OneWeb is using lasers to um, for satellites that might be um, across a, a Leo that's on the other side of the of the space. Um, will actually use a, a laser to go back up to a geostationary as a relay and back and then the data relay the data back down to an earth station so there is uh opportunity for inter interoperability um between, there's the, also, between the between the two constellations exactly that's one web that's one web's design now there's also um because of uh starlink and you there are a lot of people jumping on there yeah you're going to see oversubscription um like viasat there's oversubscription, you're not going to get the same bandwidth. And so you're thinking a pipe that, for example, is a gigabit or two or 10 gigabits exactly. up or down link mm -hmm. into the constellation, may be oversubscribed by the number of, down the number of subscribers receivers. that are pointing to that thing. Yeah. And then, you know, they're still figuring out, you know, during that handoff, how to keep a static IP. Uh, because a, a lot, and, and yes, SRT and RIST um, are, are enabling to have a, a, a much more IP environment, uh, but it is still not, um, it, it is usable, but not on, on a long-term continuous broadcast, uh, because there is a lot of infrastructure that goes into an NBC's receive and the, you know, that whole network is built. Um, so there, there is some challenges there. Now, for L, from LBI standpoint, it is, you know, we're, we are actually being one of the um, ground stations for the low Earth orbit. So, you know, there's, we have a lot of opportunity um, going for us because we can do disaster recovery. We can be a, 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 an IP head end. Uh, we can also uh, provide services for, um, you know, studio. And, and there's a lot of opportunity um, a more uh, above and beyond, um, you know, video uh, distribution. Like I said, we're, we're disaster recovery. So, you know, if if a disaster recovery a fire network, you know, um, has 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 a need for a smaller dish, you know, we'll, we'll work with that. Well, and that leads to my last question. Um, when you start looking at the avail 